Hello, I'm Bob Johnson. Welcome to another election special programme here on Wickham Sound. Over the next couple of days, we'll be broadcasting my interviews with six of the seven candidates who are standing for election in the Wickham constituency and who want your vote in the general election on the Thursday, the 12th of December. One candidate, VJ Soro, who is standing for UKIP, was unable to find time to give us an interview. In a few moments, we will hear from the independent candidate, Ed Gemmell. At 6.30, it'll be ter- the turn of Julia Wassell from the Wickham Independence, and after 7 o'clock I will speak to Labour's Khalil Ahmed. Tomorrow from 6pm we will broadcast the interviews with Tony Brodel, who's standing for the Liberal Democrats, Steve Baker, who is standing for the Conservatives, and the Green Party's Peter Sims. All the interviews with the candidates standing in both Wickham and Beaconsfield, as well as the two roundtable discussions that I carried out with the candidates, can be heard again on our website, which is wickhamsound.org.uk. Today's first interview, then, is with the independent candidate standing in Wickham, Ed Gemmell, and I started by asking him to tell us a bit more about himself. I was born not that far away in Reading, so um, then brought up mainly in Surrey. Um, I then uh, went to school there, then I went over to a boarding school out in Somerset. Um, I was there until 18. Um, I then joined the army. I did a short service limited commission in the army, um, in the Queen's Regiment. Um, I then went to university in Kent, Canterbury, to study law. Um, I proceeded to um, just about get a degree um, while I um, graduated in rugby at the same time. Um, And then I uh, moved on to the city, taking articles in the big city law firm, um, law society finals in Birmingham, and then ended up qualified as a solicitor in London with a big law firm now called CMS Cameron McKenna. Okay, and so how did you get into politics? Has, has that been a, is that something that, that's, that's been there for a long time, or is that a fairly recent thing? Uh, well, I don't consider myself in politics, and I don't consider myself a politician. Okay. Um, in terms of changing my entire life and getting started on my current path, um, the critical date was June the 3rd this year, but it was obviously a growing um, thing in my life. I've been consistently growing in my worries about the climate. I've been consistently frustrated in my... Um, efforts at recycling, my efforts in controlling my own consumption um, and I became more and more worried up to the point of June the 3rd where I finally stepped across the line and started World No Disposable Cup Day um, purely to try and do something that I thought I could actually do to try and help the environment in a small way. Um, We launched World No Disposable Cup Day, I ended up with about 20 volunteers joining me Um, we worked on it for about three months and it was on the 4th of October and as many of your listeners will have seen we were highly successful we even got Boris Johnson's disposable cup pulled out of his hand by his PR manager one or two days before our event as he was exiting the Conservative Party conference and as she did it she said no disposable cups which you you can't get better than that really can't (laughs) as, as a campaign What was it particularly about the disposable cups? Are you somebody who goes to the coffee chains a lot and and has a lot of disposable cups? Are you someone who sees a lot of the the, the cups around? Um, The first aim was to to tackle something in waste and climate change that I thought I would be able to deal with, so a very focused, specific issue. The next thing was to take something that was close to the heart of many people in my industry. Since um, finishing as a lawyer, I've run a sports marketing company um, abroad, and then I created um, a small advertising agency and where currently we do advertising inside thousands of hairdressing salons Um, and many people in the advertising industry and marketing personnel all over the place frequent a lot of coffee shops so it was something close to everyone's heart but the real part of it is when you hear the statistics in Britain we use more than 7 million disposable cups a day and that's now conservative Um, we drop half a million of them on the floor we recycle less than 4% and that's because the cups are combined with paper and plastic and even worse they get into the council recycling and the council has to employ and pay people with our taxes to take them out so that they can recycle other items. The plastic lasts 40 to 400 years, enters our oceans, we know from David Attenborough and others that we have plastic islands with the largest of them getting to more than seven times the size of Great Britain Um, and we know the plastic granules are entering into the environment, into the air, into the water, into the fish and into us at about a credit card per week that we're consuming. Um, But it doesn't stop there. I mean, it's also the paper. I mean, the paper that's used even in the compostable ones and the biodegradable and all the others together, we chop down in Britain 2,800 trees a day just for our 10-minute coffee habit. So go in the countryside, look around. Every tree for 50 to 100 metres is gone 
just for our coffee habit every day. And so when did you then decide, right, OK, actually, I'm going to stand for, for Parliament? Uh, the standing for Parliament, I, I grew through having started No Disposable Cup Day. I started to get much more involved in the statistics on climate change um, and what's happening to the environment, more and more and more worried, um, and finally decided I had to stand up and do every single thing I could. So I formed and been involved in some other organisations. The culmination was to stand as an independent candidate for Wickham with the only policy is to reverse climate change. But prior to getting to that, I started another organisation called Believers Against Climate Change. Um, and we've started it in Wickham, which is a fantastically multicultural society. Um, and we have already representatives from uh, many of the Christian churches, from the Muslim mosques, from the Hindu temple. Uh, and we've invited um, people from all of the places of worship in Wickham to join us. Um, and if any representatives of any of the places of worship are listening and we, they aren't involved, then please do come and join us. Um, in fact, we had an excellent meeting with um, three of the um, candidates from uh, Labour, Liberal Democrats and Greens yesterday to talk about climate change. Uh, the Conservatives um, declined and didn't come. Um, I've then started to work on hairdressers and barbers against climate change because of my industry and I'm an organiser of the Wickham climate strikes. And the next Wickham climate strike will be on the 29th, so on Friday this week, at 8 o'clock at the top of Marlow Hill just outside Wickham High where the bus stops are and I hope that the other candidates in the election will be coming together so we can all join to say that the problem with climate change is universal and we all have to act on it now. You mentioned the Greens. I'm assuming that that's a party that has interested you in, in the past with, with everything that you're saying. How come you're not standing as the Green candidate? I know that there is someone else standing, but, but why, why not go down that route? The Greens are a great party. Peter Sims is a lovely man, and I have great sympathy with um, many of the policies of the Green Party. It's about focus. Um, I have been a Green Party member. I turned up to the Green Party conference and I argued against the net zero 2030 target because it isn't early enough. And we'll come on to the science maybe in a minute, but it's not early enough. We need to go faster. Uh, net zero um, carbon 2025 has to be the target and the aim because we have run out of time on the planet and Britain needs to lead. And the reason for me not being inside uh, the Green Party or standing, let's say now, only on one um, aspect of which the Green Party is also aware is that the Green Party is unfocused. It's focused on climate change, it's focused on remain, it's focused on proportional representation, it's focused on social justice and many other good things. But we've run out of time and we have to focus on the existential threat to all of us and particularly to all the children and grandchildren in our country and everywhere in the world and we've got to deal with it now. Time has run out. All those that are thinking this is an election about Remain and Brexit are totally confused. It will not matter which side of the bus they're sitting on when the bus goes off the cliff. We have to pull the emergency brakes now. We should have done it 5, 10, 20 years ago, and we haven't. That's why I'm standing against the Greens, because of focus. OK. From what you say, you know, it's very clear that you are a, a one-issue candidate. Um, but if you are elected as our MP, clearly you are going to be voting on lots and lots of different issues. So I will just run through a few of those now. And if you can just let us know what you think, uh, that will be very interesting. You mentioned Brexit. So so, so let's start with Brexit. How, how did you vote, first of all, in the uh, referendum in 2016? Uh, well, how I voted doesn't necessarily affect how I might um, vote if I was an MP in Parliament. Um, I voted to remain. Um, the and I think I'd probably answer some of your questions almost in a roundabout way before we even get to them, is that if I get to Parliament, I'm getting to Parliament to save this country, to save the people in this country, the children, the poor, and people in other countries from global warming and climate crisis. Um, if I happen to be in the lucky position that I was the one vote that one of the sides needed um, in order to swing an important motion or alternatively to hold the sway of power, I would give my vote to that side on all of the issues that they are proposing on the basis that they give all of their votes to me on 2025 net zero and we bring in a very comprehensive law to get us to net zero 2025 with massive other um, environmentally friendly and climate crisis um, important legislation. And it's not because I would always agree with it, it's because climate crisis is the biggest issue, the one that affects us all and has to be dealt with. 
in relation to the other issues, there will always be a divergence of opinion. And if somebody's needing my one vote to swing it, there's already 300 or 350 people in Parliament thinking that way and a similar number thinking the other way. I won't be going on any extreme ventures on my own. The only extreme venture is trying to save us from the climate crisis. Everything else is incidental. OK. What about the NHS as an organisation and also with regards to, to the environmental impact of the NHS? Right. Um, again, on the basis that climate crisis is the overarching issue, um, in relation to the NHS, I, I fervently would like to see the NHS better organised, better funded and working better for everyone. That has to be in the light of climate change and what we need to do to uh, um, avoid the problems with climate change. And as, a, as an aside on that, if we are don't address climate change um, quickly enough, if the projections of immigration um, and displacement of people around the world, which vary from 250 million to 1.3 billion within the next 20 to 30 years, if those projections um, come to fruition, and as I say, 250 million is the minimum, then those people are going to need somewhere to come and live, and vast numbers will come to Britain. We will have immigration wildly above anything we've ever seen before with people who have nothing in their hands, and our NHS is going to need to be able to deal with them. So the problems of the NHS now are small compared to how we need to already start adapting the NHS to deal with what's going to happen in 20 to 30 years' time. And I would imagine that you'd say the same, therefore, with regards to, to housing provision in um, Absolutely the same. I mean, with housing provision, we have got the other major issue that houses at the moment are soaking up an enormous amount of electricity, which is still dominated by fossil fuels. Um, and we have to, A, houses must not be built unless they have solar panels on the top, unless they are properly insulated, unless they are zero carbon straight away. And the, the building industry has a number of um, targets in the future, but no building should be built anymore that's not already zero carbon. Um, and we must be building housing that is taking to, into account vast numbers of people needing housing, but not being able to have the, the um, over-consumptive buildings that we've already had. How do you feel about the increase both in the homeless population on the streets of Wickham uh, and also the hidden homeless as well, and also the increase in people using food banks? The homeless, okay, the homeless issue with climate crisis will be hundreds and hundreds of times worse. The homeless in Wickham is something that has always worried me. Um, I work with a number of local residents um, trying to support um, a few times a year the Saunderton Lodge. Um, but of course the, the homeless, which are mainly middle-aged men, um, are unable to get onto the, the council list because they're in the, uh, the least vulnerable groupings. Um, and I have consistently met with and helped in small ways. Um, I've invited several of them to work for me in my small advertising business um, without success. So we've tried training one or two people and then they haven't turned up then afterwards. Um, and I'm not blaming them, it's an extremely difficult position and the worst thing for them is trying to get a job. When to get a job, you need an address, but even if you're going to go to an interview, you really need to have had a shower and a decent night's sleep before you can succeed in an interview. It is terribly hard. Um, it's a very small thing on this campaign. Um, Darren, one of the homeless that I'm in touch with, um, will be working with me when I get my 5,000 leaflets that I'll manage to distribute for my campaign. And Darren will be working with me, helping to distribute the leaflets to give him some small um, opportunity. Um, it's a desperately difficult thing. I wish I could help more. Uh, are all the leaflets recyclable? Uh, we went into whether the re leaflets um, were recyclable or not, and we were given statistics by the printing company suggesting that the carbon emitted from the ones that they were giving us was better than if they got it on recycled paper, and I can't guarantee that that is, is the case. All of the leaflets are deplorable, but unfortunately, to get across vital messages, all of the parties still believe that leafleting is the number one way of doing it. And the message that we have on climate change is so vital. We have to use every single means we can to get it across. What are your thoughts on the grammar school system that we have in Buckinghamshire? Um, well, um, I have two sons. Um, one of my sons is at St Michael's um, and didn't succeed in his 11 plus. The other son has succeeded in his 11 plus and will probably go to RGS. He happens to be a big rugby player as well, so that would probably suit him. Um, the, I think the grammar, the, the, the grammar school system, I think, is a fantastic leveller 
um, against the public schools and the private schools. I think it does a wonderful job. I think it is fairly deplorable that we have a system that's meant to be plucking out the most intelligent, but ends up with all of us parents sticking all of our kids into thousands and thousands of pounds worth of tutoring. Um, we've been very successfully used to explore learning and very happy with them, but others take private tutors at vastly more cost than that. Um, and so to level the playing field, we all pay for extra tutoring, which is obviously not the way it should be working. I personally think we should have a place for the more able to, to move on, and that is going to give us, hopefully, the better scientists, the better technicians, the better economists, and everything else in the future. How do you feel about the expansion of Heathrow Airport? I wouldn't do it. I mean, I, we shouldn't be expanding anything um, now to do with, in terms of transport now, everything should be viewed with the climate change focus. We shouldn't be expanding anything to do with, with airlines. We should be um, looking at the airlines and starting to concentrate on how they can decarbonise what they're doing. We should be concentrating hard on what they're doing to um, do carbon offsetting to see if it's effective, it's the right thing to do. Uh, we should be making sure that, that the very, very cheap flights unfortunately are no longer available and we should be penalising the frequent flyers. And I mean, there's several of the, of the, of the coloured tribes in the election that are wanting to do something like that. And I can only agree we have got to tackle flying as one of them. How, how we do it fairly is terribly difficult. Um, but obviously taxing fre frequent flyers or business flying is one of the ways of doing it. Uh, I'm just going to pick up on the coloured tribes comment. I'm assuming by that that you're meaning the Conservatives, Lib Dems and Labour. <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm meaning the, the main political parties, yes. Um, how do you feel about uh, HS2 and whether that should continue to go ahead? Um, I can't see any justification for HS2 and what I know about it. I'm not an expert on HS2, but I have been following from a number of local residents what's going on. I think the idea that we um, are building at vast cost destroying habitats, uh, destroying the biosphere, chopping down trees, um, causing all sorts of problems in our countryside at the same time of producing something that would appear to have fairly marginal value in a as a transport system is ridiculous. Um, I think it would be much better if we took the money and spent it on hydrogen trains as an example where we've got half our current stock is still or more than that is still diesel trains. Um, hydrogen trains in Germany have already been launched. They could be here within a year or two and if we took all the HS2 money and put it into it we could have a complete hydrogen train system emitting not carbon, but water as the byproduct. What did you think about the recent Extinction Rebellion protests? Um, Extinction Rebellion, I'm not an Extinction Rebellion person myself, um, and that's partly because I think we all need to use our skills in the best way we can. And if everybody brings their skills to the, to the fore, helping to protect climate change, we all have different things to offer. Um, and I did go and speak at a number of the Extinction Rebellion events. I spoke to about seven or 800 Extinction Rebellion um, supporters outside the BBC um, and I talked to them about uh, the current science and I made sure that um, everybody was aware of the basics uh, and the basics that we talked about the UN saying that we have only um, uh, less well, just over 10 years to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees uh, the latest UN report from a day or two ago though is saying we're well on track now for three to four degrees by the end of the century that used to be the worst case scenario the worst case scenario from UN scientists is now six to seven degrees. I also talked to both Extinction Rebellion and many others about the scientists' warnings. Most people are not aware that in October 2017 there was a world scientists' warning given to us. It was a second notice and it was issued by 21,000 scientists. Um, and those 21,000 scientists told us we've already started the next extinction event and we've started it now and we have to act now, not within 10 years, as the UN may give us the idea. Um, and on the 5th of November, there was another warning issued and this was World Scientist Climate Emergency Warning. Um, and that was issued on the 5th of November by 11,000 scientists telling us we need to act now. At the same time as President Trump was rolling his November the 5th barrel of gunpowder under the Paris Accord, um, trying to take America out of it. Remember, remember the 5th of November. And I hope we remember it for the 11,000 scientists warning and not Donald Trump's. Okay. Obviously, as a, a single um, party candidate, um, if you were in Westminster, you, you would not be making lots and lots of policy. Let's say that you, you were introducing a private member's bill. What, what would be the specifics of that private member's bill? Net zero 2025 and everything that it's going to take us to get there. <coughs> um, and it would mean looking at, and I don't have the specifics on this one, but it would be looking at how a climate emergency can be made a real emergency. 
how we can move on that to a war footing, how we can take our entire focus. I mean, if we say that we have 300,000 civil servants in the country at the moment, then 150,000 of them should be focusing on climate change, as that is the single most important matter. It doesn't mean that we ignore the others, but it means we focus on what's needed. Um, within the bill, we'd be looking at where we move our focus of financing and industry. And on a war footing, during World War II, we had 75% of our industrial capacity spent on winning the war. Um, we spent 47% of our national income, effectively our GDP, at trying to win the war. And we did remarkable things because of our focus on a war footing. Um, I mean, people talk about why it's impossible to get to net zero 2025 and 2030 is already extremely ambitious. And I've seen the Green Party's proposals on it, which are well thought out. But even the Green Party, who I think a lot of, um, actually have, uh, have done it in a more of a business as usual kind of model than what's the most extreme way they can get to business as usual. Well, when Hitler reached the beaches of Normandy, we didn't look at business as usual. We moved everything to, to, to deal with the threat and we dealt with it. And there were ships, desi ships designed in Britain that the Americans then built for us that were taking around 250 days to build before the war. And then one of them managed to be built in four and a half days during the war, although the average was higher. And that's the sort of focus. And we need to get in, we need to put focus on these things and then we will find better and better of ways of dealing with it. If none of the changes that you're talking about are introduced, how do you see Wickham and, and let, let's put it out to the wider world in the year 2025? Um, well, in 2025, everyone's going to be enormously more worried. Um, I think in, um, in Wickham, we will see a vast change in the political landscape. And I don't believe for one second that any political candidate, candidate will get elected in Wickham in five years' time without focusing absolutely at the forefront on climate change and what they're going to do about it, including local issues linked to climate change. Um, as far as the world's concerned, we'll have a lot more fires. Sydney will be will be worse. The Amazon will be worse. Venice will have it, have it every year. The 30-year floods in Yorkshire that have happened twice this year will be happening every year. Um, more and more people who don't have the money to buy the insurance and everything else will be suffering. Um, we will see more inclement weather um, and we will be um, looking at ourselves thinking we've shot ourselves in the foot because we didn't act earlier. I mean, locally in Wickham, we need to now get a climate emergency declared in Wickham. Parish councillors need to declare it. District councillors need to declare it. We need a county council to declare it. We need the unitary council when it comes in to declare it. And then we need to act on it by having homes that are better insulated, have solar panels, by um, getting on with um, greening our transport system, by only getting in um, buses that are um, electric, by... Um, reducing the, the numbers of cars by encouraging people to share um, car ownership, by bringing in extra cycling, by doing all the things that we should be doing, reforestation, by finding ways to do it. There are many, many, many different things that we should be doing, and they're all obvious, um, many of them, and we need to be acting on them now, not waiting till 2025. I'll be crying into my beer if, I'm, if we wait, don't do anything till 2025. And, and putting the question from a positive point of view, then, if things do start to happen, if everything that you're talking about does happen, uh, let, let's go to 2030. What will Wickham and the world look like then? Well, um, I think if we go net zero 2025 in the UK and we ambitiously pursue it, we'll be the first in the world. Um, now, we should be. Um, because Britain is a leader. It's also a country that's respected by others because of English language, because of London, because of a lot of other things. We're trusted in many ways, um, although that trust has eroded over the last three or so years with our political wrangling. Um, if we lead the world, um, the world will follow. Um, that will make the world a safer place. But if we also lead the world and we get to net zero in 2025, we will have the technology, we will have the hardware and the software and the systems and the engineering skills and the mechanical skills. We will have done everything that needs to be done to get there and the world will buy it from us. If we don't get there first and if we drag our feet, not only will the world um, suffer catastrophically, but also we will then have to spend vast amounts of money buying it from everybody else to try and catch up in a world where actually there's more damage done and we're going to have to do more to try and put it right. So we will be very proud of ourselves. Society will change. I think it will be a society in which we will think more of others 
In fact, I think we will be a society which will be um, somewhat fairer. We will have to look after uh, the poorer and more vulnerable sections of society as we make these changes. Um, those at the top will have to um, look at the, the greater good, and the greater good is to make sure that we can all move forward successfully, live sustainably, live next to each other with the large numbers of people we've got, and that all of our systems are carbon neutral and are helpful to us in our daily living. What do you think is the role of an MP? What do I think the role of an MP is? Well, I, I might have said um, three and a half years ago that the role of an MP was to um, be a servant leader, to show leadership on issues, to take difficult decisions and to reach consensus and levels of cooperation. Um, I think we haven't seen great levels of cooperation or consensus over the last three and a half years on almost anything. Um, and I think that any MP going into Parliament now, that their singular, singular behavioural characteristic should be to find ways of cooperating. I mean, I don't feel that um, different political divides are actually that great if people sit down, look at what the real issues are that are driving um, each other's decisions and then try and reach a compromise. Um, and I really do think that British pragmatism and compromise has disappeared over the last three or four years and the new batch of MPs have to bring it back. Finally, if you do become our MP, will you seek a second home nearer Westminster or will you continue to live where you live now? On the base, I can hardly afford my first home. I don't think I'm going to be seeking a second home, but no, not at all. I, and I think that second homes now with the climate change issues, again, I, I don't think I could ever even morally justify having a second home. Um, I think that I'm very happy living where I am um, and I think even if I was to get to Parliament and have an MP salary, um, I would have to be donating a fair amount of that to other charities or towards charities related to dealing with climate change or helping people that are susceptible to it because I couldn't justify the salary I'm getting in the present world um, if that was the case. So no, I wouldn't be having a second home. I would be living in my home in Hazelmere um, and very happy in it. That was the independent candidate Ed Gemmell who is standing in the Wickham constituency. You can hear that again along with my other interviews with the candidates standing in both Wickham and Beaconsfield as well as the two roundtable discussion programmes that we broadcast with all the candidates on our website which is wickhamsound.org.uk. Coming up next we're hearing from Julia Wussell who is standing for the Wickham Independents. You're listening to Wickham Sound.